Okay, so we've got uh, Tom Ehrensperger here with uh, Wix Sim or Weather Sim. Uh, yes. what, 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 what do you call that? Uh, just call it WX Sim. WX uh, Sim. Weather Simulator, you know, WX for weather and Sim for simulator. And I've got that displaying on my screen right here. Okay, so this is a tool where we can input uh, different parameters with the weather at uh, a station that we're looking at. And we can, I guess, uh, it, would, it, would it be accurate to describe this as a physical simulation, physics simu simulation? It is. It started, uh, a good way to understand it is to understand its evolution over time. And it started as an experiment to see if I could model the diurnal temperature curve, the night and day temperature changes, um, based on thermal radiation, you know, emission from the Earth and um, incoming sunlight changing with the sun's altitude and so forth. At first, it was just a little experiment, but then it grew and grew. And I in included more and more factors of infrared emissivity from clouds and so forth. And it became such a good simulation that I started to see forecast potential in it. Now, at that time, the uh, things like clouds and rain and so forth were in, were put in externally. But at the core of it is an energy balance model, um, energy coming in, energy going out to simulate temperature, because that was always a big interest of mine, is just seeing if I, could, if I could get the temperature forecast correct. And then as more data became available, when the internet came along, you have to realize this goes back to the early 1980s, you know, before right. there was any internet. Um, but as the internet became available and all kinds of uh, first surface data that I could initialize it with came in, um, and then external model data, it became sort of a hybrid, uh, sort of constrained guardrail-wise, you know, upper air temperatures and... Uh, um, advection. Actually, the advection is native to it. It does do its own advection. But the wind, uh, you know, WXM doesn't model the entire globe or even a large region. It's a single site model, but supported by advection from surrounding regions. That's its own thing. And then also supported by external model data. So it, it gives me the flexibility to tune it for a given location. And you know, different places have different issues with, you know, degree of urbanization or cold air drainage at night and the characteristics of the surface, you know, are going to determine that temperature variability. And so, so what I really have now is something that filters in all kinds of external data, uh, surface, upper air data, buoy data, um, and largely the GFS model, that because I have customers all over the world, that's the one freely available one that I can easily, you know, make available for everyone. But also in the United States, uh, the North American mesoscale gets factored in. So it's a blend of models supporting a core that's something I developed on my own. Uh, it's not that great at telling you anything you don't know from the other models about whether or not it's going to rain. But it does have a unique contribution to make with regard to temperature, dew point, and some related diurnally varying things, you know, formation of dew or frost and variations in wind speed during the day. For example. Yeah, as I recall, you can uh, enter uh, temperature, pressure, cloud types, all that stuff. What yeah. capability is there to import uh, other external sources? Okay, um, if there's a companion program that's part of it. It's just historically... I've I, I wrote them into, I wrote uh, WXM and Visual Basic uh, 6 is the main thing it's in now. And then I used VBNet for the um, data import part. But it uh, gets um, surface data, METAR, uh, synoptic data, um, radius on data, uh, the GFS model through a couple of filters that um, uh, one of my customers and also the son of a friend of mine helped me make some uh, data calling things that download the big grid files and call through them and sort out the variables that we need. It's about 25 variables that it um, imports, you know. Uh, okay, so it does bring in the grid data, right? It, it does It does bring in, oh, 
WX in itself doesn't bring it in. We have two servers that uh, get the grib data and call it, filter it down, and interpolate it for the exact location in question. Um, and then, uh, in addition to that, it also gets the uh, GFS and NAM MOS products. Uh, that's used for advection purposes, like if the wind shifts during the forecast. And the wind shift is determined by these external models mainly, except to have a sea breeze routine too. But um, so, uh, oh, and some ozone data. I mean, you know, for, for UV sunburn index type things. So we get all this. And then also, it can import data from a home weather station. It's not necessary, but it's helpful. And that's current conditions plus like it, it averages the last four days temperature to get kind of a handle on soil temperature. It also gets the last 30 days of precipitation to help get an idea of soil moisture. And basically the wetter the soil, the more suppressed the diurnal variation is, and also the more humid it tends to be. So Okay. Yeah, very good. Um, so if I want to look at the eclipse data here for Atlanta, how would I go about setting that up? Okay. Uh, I, like I want to demonstrate this for our uh, users here, our okay. audience here. Uh, I mean, all right. So uh, you you could do this um, as a fake forecast, you know, where you don't bother to import all the data just to show the to isolate the effect of the eclipse. What you could simply do is, first of all, there's about three ways to access this, but go to uh, start up at the top. Okay. Then go. To auto run and other settings which brings up a form with a lot of stuff on it but over on the right you'll see something about planning a solar eclipse all right uh let me go in and uh, set up this eclipse again okay. going back and, uh, it should have remembered it probably um uh but you can go ahead and go through the motion again okay so i've got that in there disable auto run and yeah, the main uh, screen here is still showing 17th, so I'm right. going to set that to 21st. Uh, Maybe uh, sometime in the morning. Late on the 21st. Um, back it up. Just go ahead and say 17th or 18th. Or okay. 19th. All right, we'll do and 17th. That way, you know, the, because what I'd like you to see is the change in the curve. You're going to see, a as, as the program runs, you'll see, a, among other things, a temperature curve. It'll be a yellow line being graphed on the, at the bottom, and you'll see it go through its sort of pseudo sinusoidal shape that it does which is what i spent years trying to perfect was getting that behavior correct so you'll see a normal diurnal temperature curve and then when it gets to the eclipse day you'll see a bite taken out of it you'll also see there's a kind of a bluish line on there that's the visible sky transmittance or, you know the amount of sunlight compared to maximum possible that's getting through you'll see a v-shaped dip in that uh, during the eclipse and then you'll see a slightly delayed response in the temperature as a result of it so um, set it off and running and I think you'll see that happen on the 21st yeah yeah that that came up it's at the very very end oh, okay. you uh, can change it the it's about a four-day forecast here so yeah okay. it is showing that that dip there definitely okay so let's and see here. That dip is, you know, what I've got going on there is based on the parameters you put in on that little eclipse form, it, 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 you know, simulates the disk of the sun and the disk of the moon. It overlaps them, calculates the areas of circles. The only, and, and it's pretty accurate with that. The only thing I've left out is a very, very subtle thing called limb darkening, where the sun is a little less bright at the edges in the middle. I, I didn't actually think about that, but. It computes the amount of incoming solar radiation, and since the model actually calculates temperature changes based on energy transfer, it, it is truly calculating what the effect really ought to be. I'm, I'm very eager to get uh, ground truth. Uh, um, there was an eclipse back in 1994, an annual eclipse that was about 70% coverage here, and I did try it out some then. And it was about the same magnitude change. That change okay. is sometimes overstated. I've heard sometimes people say it drops 10 or 15 degrees. It probably shouldn't drop that much. But um, uh, Yeah, looking at this graph here, it's very interesting. I, I see this percent VST. Uh, what would that be there? Visible sky transmittance. Okay. Uh, 
a hundred would be a totally clear day with no clouds, and um, of course it dipped to nearly zero. Okay, because and it's covered up. Yeah, and I can see that the temperature goes up to about ninety, and then it drops about uh, two degrees during the eclipse. And that's during a time that normally would have continued to rise. That's early afternoon. They were right. peaking around four. Yeah, and uh, let's see here. I don't see any other uh, noticeable changes on this graph. So I guess the main impact there is going to be on the temperature. Temperature, you know, ultraviolet flux, uh, you know, in the in the sunlight itself. Uh, another thing you could do that may or may not be worth the demo is you can choose auto cumulus uh, on the main form. There's a checkbox for that. It tends to get overridden by imported data if you use that because those models are supposed to keep track of it too. But if you if you check the auto cumulus, okay. you will also see a decrease in cumulus cloud cover as a result of the cooling from the eclipse. Okay, so I, I so I check that so we can uh, okay. regenerate this. Right, do that, and then I think you'll see. Um, uh, am I going to do a uh, start fresh or? Uh, uh, you can do. Uh, um, do repeat. A repeat, uh, okay. Bring up almost the same data and then. Okay, I did uh, repeat the uh, menus uh, disappeared here, so maybe I have to do full start again. Uh, oh, right, right you'll, you'll go to full start, yes. Okay. And then you can have auto cumulus checked. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, auto cumulus is on. And just going through the menus here. Okay. And there it comes again, generating the uh, the forecast. It's going to be only subtly different. Um, I think what you're going to see is that visible sky transparency. So you'll see it undulate a little bit, maybe dip a little bit in the afternoon as some cumulus develop and then uh, go back up a little bit at night as they dissipate. And there are lots of other ways to display the data, um, and, which I can certainly tell you about. But there's a retrieval tool that can d display graphs or text of about, I'm not sure I've counted, 60 or 70 different variables that this puts out. Right. So you can construct all kinds of graphs. Okay, yeah. So what I'm looking at here also is the text. And it's showing that uh, we got to 90.5 earlier in the afternoon, then it dropped down to about 88, no, 87.9. Okay. So I'm looking at the numbers here. Up just a little, maybe after that. Um, Did it bump back up just a little bit as the eclipse ended, maybe? Yep, it went back up to 89.2. Okay. And then started falling off as we lost uh, the heating. All right. So that's uh, pretty neat there. Um, so if people order this, they can uh, play around with full totality and see what that does too, right? And and what most people, most of my customers, not nearly all, but, but most are people with a home weather station. They may have a website they like to upload their data to, and they want to publish forecasts that are very specific for their location. So what I do when they purchase it is I customize the files. It's quite a bit of work to get um, very specific data together for them. Sometimes I study their not only their general climatology, but their actual station data and constructing that. And then they uh, produce and upload forecasts. It can all be automated. Um, or you can intervene and put in your own expertise if you have it. Um, I have a few professional forecasters who for instance, will manipulate that uh, interrupt planner. And, you know, if they don't completely believe the GFS data, for example, maybe they're looking at the Euro, too, and they don't quite buy something, they can manually bend those curves and put something they believe is more realistic. So okay. it, it's kind of neat that it's interactive in that way. It serves to make, make it more flexible for somebody who's really trying to generate a good forecast, but it's also educational for someone who just wants to see how these different things influence things. You know, as, as I was growing up, I was fascinated with the temperature. 
I was empirically observing what clouds did and what wind did, and it took years of experience to see what happens. With this program, if you just want to play around with it, you can just run simulations one after the other, change the cloud cover, the wind speed, and just gain experience virtually. Right. Well, this is uh, pretty neat here, and uh, I'll go ahead and uh, show this to my viewers, uh, I think. Uh, I'll probably try to... I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to get this on tonight, but uh, okay. either later tonight or tomorrow. Okay. And, and I'm you, just trying to make an improvement. Um, uh, you know, it's remembering the eclipse uh, during the use of, of, that, of the program. What I did not get done and I'm working on tonight actually is so that it'll remember that eclipse when you reopen the program. Okay. I so won't forget those things. So uh, right now it, it, it forgets when you close the program. So I'm trying to have that data come back up. All right. So you say you've been uh, waiting for this eclipse for 45 years now, right? Five years. I, um, I found out about it after I got home from the eclipse. I begged my dad to take me to up in Nova Scotia, 1972. I think it's the one in Carly Simon's song, <laughs> You're So Vain. You know that one? Oh. Uh, but uh, but anyway, uh, after seeing that, I was so moved by it that I just had to see another one. I came home and checked out from the Atlanta Public Library, Canon der Finsternis. It's a huge German language book written in 1885, and somebody by hand calculated 8,000 eclipses over 33 centuries. And, wow. that, and I saw this eclipse path and saw that it came near me. And I've had my mind and my eye on it for 45 years. So kind of eager. Yeah, very good. Well, we're just a few days away now. So yeah, anyway, I've got I've got to get prepared for my uh, weather cast here, but I appreciate appreciate you uh, joining us and okay, thank you. and we'll put this on and uh, hopefully I, I guess you'll be processing any orders that come in over the weekend. Um, I can't do anything over the weekend because I'm going to be up in the mountains enjoying I the see. eclipse. So I'll I'll be back in town by Tuesday night. But people can play with the demo, right? Oh yes. Oh okay. yes. Okay. Very good. Okay, and that's at, uh, is it WXM.com? Yes. Okay. All right, and, great. Uh, and, and also, um, I suppose I could uh, link off my webpage, link to your site to, that, so they can see the video and also see your site. Okay, yeah, that, that would be but, great. Okay. Okay, well, I'll go ahead and I'll let you go then. I, I Again, okay. thanks, and uh, good luck uh, with this eclipse. I'll Thank be up in so Nebraska much. and... I guess oh, you are going to Nebraska. Then. Yeah, and I guess you're heading Next. up to Tennessee, right? Uh, northeast Georgia. All right, Iowa. great. So. All right, okay. well, good luck. All right, thanks, thanks. and uh, we'll talk to you next time. Okay, thank you. Good night. All right.